it will be nice. <laughs> My name's Tony Wilbert. I am a writer with CoStar News, and I'm here with Ian Hurdle. He is director and founder of the agency's Turks and Caicos office, and the agency is a luxury residential brokerage based in Beverly Hills, California. And so Ian, when, I, when they asked me to do this, I, I knew some about the Caribbean, having worked in the Cayman Islands, but where is the Turks and Caicos? So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, Turks and Caicos is based on the southeast end of the uh, Bahamas Archipelago. Uh, we're about an hour and 15 from Miami, three hours from New York, just shy of four hours from Toronto to give you some sort of guidance there. Same distance south to Cayman would be southeast to Turks. How long did it take you to fly to Miami from there? Again, hour, hour and 15 would be uh, a normal flight pattern, so it's a nice easy hop, which is obviously the accessibility is a big deal for us. All right, so what is the luxury residential real estate like in Turks? Crazy. Um, yeah, no, we, we've had, post-pandemic, we've had an astronomical rise in our markets. Um, as, a, as a, you know, 2019, before the pandemic, we had a record year and, you know, 16 brokerages, 100 plus agents, recorded about $350 million in sales. We did half a billion in the first six months of this year. Um, and as a direct result of the growing brand that is Turks and Caicos, the demand for that type of product, particularly in North American market coming in and identifying value, second, third, some cases, 10th home, and, and really, you know, elevating it from there. So who are your buyers? Uh, yeah, again, predominantly American. Uh, historically used to be East Coast. We're seeing a lot more West Coast penetration now. Um, small percentage Canadians, but obviously growing now that their borders are reopened. Uh, and again, we get less European traffic than, say, the Eastern Caribbean, but obviously, given that we're very low density, luxury residential, we do get a small percentage coming in from Europe that buy on the very high end. And with the borders being closed in some countries, how did Turks and Caicos navigate that? So I think that's what's really seen us rise as the number one real estate destination in the Caribbean now is how effective our government. Uh, obviously, we're a British territory, so we have that support. Um, we improved our hospital infrastructure very quickly during the first couple of months of lockdown, um, created a portal system, uh, the first of its kind in the Caribbean that made it very easy for people to come in and out. And then literally once we reopened our borders in July, we were the first island that really, you know, had that accessibility, gave people a place to go, felt safe that they could travel to. We handled very, you know, COVID very well initially. And that has continued to go on even with humongous tourism numbers. We still keep our COVID cases, you know, very, very low. Um, everyone's very respectful of the rules. There's still masks to go in restaurants. The curfews just ended. But compared to many places in the Caribbean, Cayman as an example, just recently reopening its borders, uh, we're well ahead of the curve and, and very easy to navigate and very safe once you get in there. So in addition to the Cayman Islands, what islands, which countries does Turks and Caicos, Caicos compete with? So predominantly, I mean, we've, we've really only come up, I would say, as a brand and as a, as a real estate market in the last four or five years, uh, really off the back of Hurricane Irma 2017. Um, Whereas many islands in the Caribbean got absolutely devastated and we, we got smacked category five plus plus plus. Uh, we follow Miami Dade, build code, we have good architecture, we have good builders, we have a great private sector hotel and tourism association. So whereas the rest of the Caribbean had this sort of 12 to 18 month hangover from recovering from storms, we were open by Christmas and it was business as normal from January. And obviously we had a softening in the market straight after the hurricane, as you would expect. People weren't buying, people were nervous about buying, you know, big hurricane has that effect but by Q end of Q1 beginning of Q2 of 2018 you could start to see that people were coming in droves and that really carried on and escalated up until obviously COVID um, but the I want to call the groundwork had been done in terms of giving people confidence about the product we did a lot of blind selling during the first three months of lockdown great social media great digital media great video content versus a lot of the Caribbean and we were able to convince a lot of people that we were a worthwhile investment to buy blind Mind. Um, and then as a result, once our borders reopened as quickly as they did, those same people came down, were very happy with their investment, and then they told their friends, and their friends came down, and it's just been seven days a week ever since. So buyers will 
commit millions of dollars without ever seeing the property. How does that work? Uh, so yes, I did one at, what was it, 6.495 million. Uh, had never seen the property, had never been in the property. Uh, I managed to obviously sneak out of the house with my phone, do a quick FaceTime call, and that was enough to say, yeah, we trust you, Ian, let's do this. That same property today is probably worth 12 million, and that's in the space of 15, 16 months. How much has pricing accelerated in the past year? Uh, I was explaining to, uh, to a young lady here to my right earlier, I, I set the record for a two-acre parcel in Long Bay earlier this year, uh, 155 feet of frontage, we, you know, 3.2 million, which was about $700,000 above the market value at that time. That same parcel now is probably worth six, six and a half million less than a year later. We've had two off-market sales recently at that price point, cash, quick close. Uh, these parcels are no longer even coming on the market, such as the demand for this level of beach product on Providenciale specifically. And is that Long Bay in the picture, or what's in the picture there? Uh, that's actually Ambergus Key. So that's one of our private island offerings. Um, Ambergus Key has the longest private runway in the Caribbean. Uh, that house there is listed at 4.995 million. Um, beautiful little four bed there. Um, but no, that's each of our islands and keys has its own unique identity, uh, and each one has a different offering. And this is this is very exclusive, very private that you can see very low density in terms of development. Um, but again, the architecture, the style, the demand for that type of product is high. How would the owner get there? How do you access that? So that, like I said, they have a customs on that island. So if you're a private jet owner, you could actually fly in with your private jet. And we obviously get a lot of private jet traffic. Um, for somebody else that was flying commercial, and they do have a tourism program there, they have vacation rentals, they have a small hotel. So you would fly into the main island of Providenciales. And once you clear customs there, it's uh, a small charter plane that takes you over that's complimentary as part of your stay. Um, so you're there within 20 minutes of landing on the main island. So assuming a lot of these owners don't live there year round, how, how, how is security, how safe are the islands? So people that are not living there year round are normally putting their house in a vacation rental program. It's one of the big drivers of how we're able to sell properties. You know, on a $6 million investment, you should be expected to see somewhere between six hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars a year gross on your rental. Now, obviously your net would be dictated on who your property manager is, what your marketing expenses are, what your cost of living is, and obviously how much you're using the property yourself. Some people don't use the property. Some people use it a month of the year. Some people are down for six months. So those numbers can change. But from a real estate perspective, that's the rule of thumb that we're working to in terms of how we sell these properties, not just as homes, but effectively businesses. Um, in terms of security, obviously, once you've got rental traffic, people are in and out regularly. You've got a property management company. You don't need security in the Turks and Caicos. We have very low crime. Yes, sometimes some of these houses will have a camera we're on the gate, but we've got a good police force. As, you know, we're not a high crime jurisdiction um, versus, say, a Bahamas or a Cayman. Do, do you have to battle that perception that if someone says, hey, I was in the Dominican Republic and I kept reading about all these people who were being victims? I, I think as a growing brand, just the education process, one of the reasons why I'm here today, getting people to understand that it's not the wild, wild west. Yes, we're a third world country. We're growing. We're only really 20 years old. Yes, there's some infrastructure issues. Yes, there's some administration issues. But people are spending millions of dollars because once they come there and understand that it's not this crazy wild place where it's not safe to be, and it's actually a really really wonderful lifestyle. Um, yeah. And, and it's a hard sell. It still has beaches, right? Unlike some Caribbean countries, the beaches seem so to this, be disappearing. This is a 24.995 million offering on East Caicos. It's one of the few uninhabited islands left. So the opportunity there is we have Grace Bay Beach on Providenciales, which is considered, if not number one, number two, number three, every year by various outlets as the world's best beach. I can tell you because I've walked this, this beach is nicer. So really, this opportunity here gives you an opportunity to kickstart what would be the next tourism sector in the Turks and Caicos and obviously that's attractive to hoteliers resort development um, although most of the inquiries we've had on this one are people with massive amounts of money that want all 1400 plus acres to themselves for their home do you think that's more beneficial than having a hotel there as you try to promote the island 
I think you want a balance, you want a hybrid. You're going to need some resort development, obviously, because that brings the infrastructure that those same residential homeowners then need to, to grow out. But, uh, you know, for a project like that, you're not just buying the land and you're on your own. You're going to have to work with government and collaborate on infrastructure, you know, telecommunications, utilities, airport, you know, ferry service, dock. You know, there's a lot of, you know, whenever I look at this with people, this is not a $25 million undertaking subject to what they want to do. This is really a $250 million plan. Let's say Ralph Bivens, who's in the back, decides to buy this. How would he actually get a home built on the property? Ah, uh, good question. So basically, uh, as I said at the moment, you'd have. You <laughs> so you'd come down with me. We'd jump on a plane, um, and we'd make sure that obviously you like it. Um, and then it would be, like I said, a, a conversation with government as to we have a buyer here that's looking to invest on this basis. Obviously, we can't just leave them alone in the land of Nod. Um, you know, what are government's plans moving forward? What are they going to do as part of this process? Um, and then again, um, this particular site, uh, there's an area called Joe Grant Key that you can't see off picture. It would be a simple matter of barging materials over to that point, and then you're building out from there. Uh, the type of property you would build on that, you know, sustainable build, eco is the, is the type of inquiries that we get. We're obviously not going to be putting a concrete batching plant on this. Um, so yes, I mean, it would be a process, which is why, you know, virgin land, golden, uninhabited. Um, but the build process overall, um, very simple in Turks and Caicos, notwithstanding the global supply chain issues and the rising costs that we spoke about before. So could Ralph spend Christmas 2023 at his new house? Uh, subject to what size house Ralph was building, yes, I think that would be very popular, uh, possible, yeah. yeah. Now, obviously, if we're talking a 25,000 square foot mega mansion, uh, then it might be different. And again, uh, you know, we get some weird and wonderful requests on this one. So, And, and so people who spend that much money or, or not even anywhere near that much money can have immigration status? So basically the way that it works at the moment is to achieve status on our main island, the Providenciales, it's a million dollars in a real estate investment or you know similar business opportunity. Um, that qualifies you for residency, permanent residency. Um, most people don't buy in their name, they incorporate a company that's in no way attached to any companies that they have in the US or wherever they're from. It's a completely separate vehicle. Because of their status, they, they can look at you know work permits, etc., or attaining business licenses. It's a process to get to the right to work, but it is attainable. Um, for an outer island, um, because government wants to spread the wealth and wants to see more development, it's actually only $300,000, but that has to be in a renovation or a new build. It can't just be a straight real estate purchase. Now, during the lockdown or the coronavirus, um, were people who own properties, were they able to bypass the, the, the restrictions and get to their properties? Uh, no, our government is very regimented. If you're not vaccinated, you're not coming in even if you own property. Um, they've held out their stall on that. Um, the announcement was made in August of this year. Um, immediately there was a lot of cancellations, a lot of people saying we're never coming, that's the end of your country, it's the end of tourism, it's the end of real estate. We've only got busier since that announcement. Yes, there was millions of dollars of bookings cancelled. All that happened was that void was filled with people that are vaccinated because they want to come to a safe place. And back to construction, you have a background in construction. How has that benefited your efforts? Uh, it helps hugely. I am not your atypical real estate agent. I'm uh, uh, born and raised in England uh, on a construction site from five years of age. We moved to the Cayman Islands in 1993 uh, to build spec homes. So I know how to build a home. I know how to prime a pump. I know electrics. I know all of these things. So when I'm looking at multi-million dollar houses now, I can go in and I'm famous for being very unfiltered in my approach. I'm very unluxury. No, you're not buying this. It's shit. Or no, you are buying this because it's built, 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 and it's you know a good investment. So that's what's built my career. Uh, I'm not foo foo in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm going to tell you straight if I like it or if I don't like it. Um, and it's not just construction. I had years in property management. So when we go back to what I was talking about earlier with the business aspects, do I think this four bedroom home will rent for ten thousand dollars a week, fifteen thousand dollars a week, twenty thousand dollars a week? Are you going to have to spend a half a million dollars above your original investment to get it to that stage. That's the value that I'm bringing to the table beyond it's so many square foot and I think it's worth this. So where does Turks and Caicos compare now to Grand Cayman in 1993? 
Uh, so that's a very interesting question. So I was just quoted in the Cayman Compass because the Cayman Islands is fascinated with how we as a jurisdiction have come up so quickly in the last few years and been a, a you know, we really are the number one real estate destination in the Caribbean right now. We've surpassed Cayman. Um, I don't think anybody can argue that. Obviously, this advantage we've had over 18 months where we've been open and they've been closed. You know, we live or die by tourism. It's our only sector that feeds real estate, that feeds construction. Obviously, Cayman has many ways that it generates money. Um, so they had the right and the wherewithal and the financial capability to keep locked down. But I think it has hurt them on the real estate front. They have recognized that. Outside of the Cayman Islands, obviously, you're looking at the Bahamas then as the, the sort of the free countries that close proximity to South Florida uh, and the US, that's your, your major markets for real estate in the Caribbean. They're the most developed in terms of actually having an MLS. You can, as a buyer, you can physically see, you know, these people are on the game. They know what they're doing. We can, or if agents, we can send clients down and we know they're going to be taken care of. And Grand Cayman has a pretty nice culinary scene. Where do you go? to eat at Turks and Caicos? Oh, where do I go to eat? So obviously we're blessed with great hotels. They have great restaurants. So I personally go to Seven at Seven Stars. Although I'm a little bit bougie, I like their private dining experience tasting room. So uh, uh, we do uh, we do tend to do it a little bit wild once a month in there. But there's there's several great restaurants. Obviously we have another branded properties where it's Carlton has just come in. They've got two restaurants on site. So you're going to find it hard to find a bad meal in Turks and Caicos. Although um, most of the people that are buying 8th, 10th, 12th houses don't leave their houses. The private chef experience, uh, they're bringing their own staff with them. Um, you know, that's it, it, it really is an interesting dichotomy in terms of the price points and what people do. We're seeing a lot of traction on our outer islands at the moment because people are less inclined with the hustle bustle of Provo and then less inclined with being able to go to the restaurants versus just finding the prime beach land and then developing it and then sustaining it within themselves. Now, can someone, a middle class American, can they have any way to buy down there? Absolutely. Although, again, our median price point on Providenciales right now is 1.1 million. So, if you're somebody that's looking at second home, you know, that's a big chunk of change. You know, things are good. Um, we don't have, and it's one of the things I'm critical about, we don't have great financing options on Ireland yet. We have free Canadian banks that will offer 50-50 LTV, somewhere in the high fives and the interest rates at the moment, which is not great compared to what you're seeing here in the US. So that's unattractive as a proposition. Most of the buyers that we're seeing are obviously capable of put plunking down cash for what they want to buy. Um, normally the advice is get financing on the home front, assets here, and then bring that cash down. Also helps for negotiation in the seller's market. And Ralph, we have about five more minutes, is that correct? So we can open it to questions. Michael has a question. Yes, I do. So I have two questions. One, I love some of these King Island, it's been played many times. Some of the success the game's had for decades is the tax haven capital of the world, that's the capital of the world. Yep. There's a lot of big money partly because of the tax status. Yep. Is Turks and Caicos doing that or do a similar model of the game number one? And then number two, the mega yacht industry, I'd love for you to be the 100, 200 foot industry of yachts, they have a seasonal migration. They, they summer in the Med and they winter in the Caribbean. Yep. A lot of the same parts. Does Turks and Caicos have the poor docking infrastructure to handle deep water yachts of these buyers? Do those buyers like their jets and yachts? To that being next to okay, so let's start with the first question. So we're not an offshore banking haven, but we have no capital gains tax, no inheritance tax. You know, there's no tax per se. We have a stamp duty that is basically a prop one-time property tax. So based on your investment as a rule and thumb, if you're spending a million dollars, you're going to spend another hundred thousand dollars with government. Yeah, exactly. So that that so that's your only tax. But you know, everyone forgets that we really are only 20 years old. You know, I moved there in. We didn't really see development happening until 2002. So everything that you're seeing as Turks growing is really over 19 coming up on 20 years. We are missing your right, that sort of, and I think the pandemic has, has opened government up to this, is if you live and die by tourism, 
you know, if things go backwards again, where is the money coming from? We were very fortunate the first time round. I don't know, given the lack of inventory, if we would be again. Um, so that's the first question. The second question is, is we actually were working towards a big luxury marina development on the east end of the island, um, Leeward Marina, Blue Haven Resort. And unfortunately, it got absolutely destroyed in Hurricane Irma. They're about to restart dredging and rebuilding that marina in 2022. So that should then, to answer your question, I think you're right. You see that migration coming down through the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, and then across to the Eastern Caribbean and ending up in some baths. I think we'll get there. We're probably two years away from that. But that at the moment is, for me, the missing link on the high end in terms of dealing with the inventory issues is that crowd. Yeah. Lois? Is that arena being developed by Island Capital or is it another... Uh, what is the Waterloo Holding Investment Group is the is the group behind that. Um, but no, it's not government capital. This is privately the funded. Island Capital is a company that builds marinas and like Dubai. I honestly don't know for sure, but I don't think so. No. Yeah. I have a question. Um, about, um, you know, climate change and rising sea levels. Clearly, hurricanes have been a very big factor. How do you see that in the overall big So we, we were having this conversation earlier and it's because it, I got asked the question behind the scenes earlier and it's very interesting. I, I, I have a customer that is an admitted geek. His property on Pine Key is called Geek Ho and he religiously day on day for nearly 30 years now has recorded rain, water, wind, everything. The waters in Turks and Caicos have risen by a quarter of an inch in 21 years. We don't see any side effects from rising water levels at all and we have large canal tributaries and obviously a lot of our luxury development is on canal. So uh, irrespective of what's happening, for example, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, we're not seeing that in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, in terms of storms, um, again, been there since 98. I can speak to uh, Hurricane Ike in 2008 as a Category 5. I can speak to Irma as a Category 5 plus plus in 2017. Uh, we haven't had a major storm since Marie in 2017 hit the Turks and Caicos. So uh, obviously there has been other tropical storm and hurricane events in the Caribbean at that time, and it really is anybody's guess. But if you take 2008 to 2017 as a cycle in a time where everybody's saying, we're going to build because we're getting more of these storms and more of this weather. We're not physically experiencing it. But you just mentioned that the site for redevelopment was wiped out. In 20, no, the marina, the actual pillars. So that was it. the reason why it's only just being rebuilt now is that it's actually an insurance claim. They're claiming that the original contractor didn't build it properly. That's why it's taken so long to revisit it. They only just got the payout on the claim. But no, that was that was pillars and docking in the water. In terms of physical houses, hotel development, there was a report put out by KG, KPMG in 2018 that cited how well developed and built Turks and Caicos was and how quickly it recovered versus the rest of the Caribbean. And you see a lot of that in the architecture now. It's very modular in build, flat roofs. You know, they look like concrete bunkers. They're very stylish, but they, they literally are boxes because that's what copes with storms. Ralph, do we have time for one more? Uh, what, what's the source I guess so. of uh, potable water there? So we have reverse osmosis plants. So we have a city water plant on Providentiales. Um, there's freshwater lenses on the outer islands, and it's still as it was when I moved there, trucked water into cisterns and obviously capturing rainwater. Um, but no, the, the Provo doesn't really have a lot in the way of freshwater. The one reverse osmosis plant runs off that.